Well, as Denise said, you all now have a better understanding of four of our great leaders in the state of Minnesota who are all committed uh, to leading their efforts, their coalitions, they're very passionate. Reach out to them, get to know them better, understand their issues better. So I have a, a quick update for you about Twitter. Uh, many of you took the invitation to be using your social media, uh, and I want you to know, at least according to people way above my pay grade, that we are the number one trending uh, Twitter conversation in the country right now. Yeah. Now this is also supposed to serve as a catalyst for you to keep doing that. Now, the Crash Dice Director of Early Learning is getting right on it. I bet he has more than five followers. You're probably beating me. All right. Hey, um, we're going to close today, as I said, with a rich discussion with our legislators. How are our legislators in the House and the Senate beginning to think about some of these uh, great challenges and great opportunities that we have in the state of Minnesota as it relates to youth and children. Um, our four legislators are from the Senate, Melissa Franzen and Brandon Peterson, and from the House, Ron Kresha and Ryan Winkler. Please welcome our four legislators. And our panel moderator today is from Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and it is Jim Houlihan. And uh, Jim is a great guy. He's been a good friend of uh, many of us from, uh, who work on, on a multi uh, multiple issues related to children and youth. But I'd like you to know that Jim has spent his lifetime serving the community. He served as mayor of Grand Rapids from 1990 to 95. He also served as the president and CEO of the Blandin Foundation in Grand Rapids, Minnesota uh, for uh, seven years. A great uh, tenure of service there. He's currently the president of the industrial lubricant company. Uh, this sounds terribly boring whenever he and I talk about it, but he lights up like a light bulb. He thinks this is actually pretty cool stuff. And somehow he and his family have made a living uh, at this for more than 65 years. Uh, we are delighted to have a business leader from greater Minnesota who also is a champion of building community, of leading philanthropy, of bringing voices together to make the quality of life for all of our citizens, including young children, much better. Please welcome our panel moderator, Jim Houlihan. Well, thank you very much for that welcome. I'm still trying to um, quickly do the math on my feet and understand how at age 62, I've run this business for 65 years. It has something to do with my mom and dad who started the business well before I came along. Um, I'd like to add my welcome to all of you today and my gratitude for you being here. Uh, when I was asked if I would consider moderating this panel, I wanted to because the Blanham Foundation um, believes very much in strengthening rural communities through strengthening children and youth and families. And I wanted to because it was a passion of mine and is. What I didn't know is that there would be 900 plus people here. I'm a little out of practice, so uh, please help me help you. A bit more of a welcome to our four um, panelists here. A bit more color, but we're going to go pretty quick. Thank you, Representative Ron Kresha, a Republican, first elected in 2012 from Little Falls, serving on Education and Finance Committee. I'd like to welcome Representative Ryan Winkler, DFL, first elected in 2006, living in Golden Valley, serving on Education Innovation Policy and Higher Ed Policy and Finance Committee. A welcome to Senator Melissa Franzen, a DFL, first elected in 2012, living in Edina, serving on Higher Ed and Workforce Development Committee, and Vice Chair of Health and Human Services Budget. And a welcome to Senator Brandon Peterson, a Republican from Andover, first elected to the Senate in 2012, prior to that served in the House, served on the Education Committee and Higher Ed and Workforce Development Committee. Um, I would like to just do a bit of um, grounding before we start. 
a reminder to myself and to my uh, panelists here, we stand between our crowd and lunch. And uh, we have to be done at 11.50, so my charge is to get the best out of all of us for the next 40 minutes and uh, to move us along when we need to. A reminder, our goal is to have a conversation and discussion that focuses on state policy and vision and the impact that we can have as elected representatives, as folks in the audience, on the health of our children, and the health of our youth, and the health of our state. The best way to do that would be for me to ask clear, concise questions and for you to offer wise, pithy, and sometimes short responses. <laughs> I'll do my best not to interrupt, but reserve that right if I have to. And reading the newspaper and watching television this week, the last guideline I would ask of all of you would be, if you brought a football, do not deflate it. The grounding, I think, has been done. Well, that was in kind of my uh, prep remarks. I think we've done that all morning long regarding the equity issues, regarding economic security and insecurity, regarding the disparities among uh, race, among rural, urban. And I think if it's all right with you, we'll just get into it. So my first question um, for the panelists, and it's in no order. Please speak up when you're comfortable. If there was one policy related to children and youth that you could either initiate or change with a wave of your magic wand today, what would it be? I guess it'll be ladies first. Uh, so I'll start with that. Um, I am my first term in the state legislature in the Senate, and I previously served on the Education Policy Committee. And since I've been there, I would say that if I had my magic wand today, uh, with two years of experience under my belt now, I would say early education, early childhood education would be where I would uh, like to strike more of a, not only a conversation that you all have started, but also more of an investment. Out of our state general fund uh, of about 16.8 billion, it's a big number, it's the biggest budget area in our state, government, only about 1.1% is spent on early childhood uh, accounts, which is not to say that other districts and um, private funding doesn't come into, the, into play, but if you think about it, only less than 2% of our budget, almost just 1% of our budget goes to early learning. When we know, uh, and you all know, and that's why you're here, we all agree on the investments there and the return of our, on our investment. And when we uh, are striving for dollars in the legislature and competing for dollars for programs, I sit on HHS and, and also on transportation, so I see that dynamic day to day. Uh, I think this is where we can reap the more benefits for our state and free up money not only long term for uh, our higher ed budgets, but also uh, to create the workforce that we need. And also just because we want to make sure that we give every person, every individual, the opportunity to excel, and it starts early. It starts from day one. So that would be where I would go. Um, I know it's a big bucket, but in that I would uh, stress the scholarships. I've been a supporter of the scholarships since I started in the Senate. I um, carried the supplemental budget for the scholarships uh, funding uh, my second year there, and I will continue to be a big advocate for the early childhood scholarships. And another plug uh, is a bill that I just introduced yesterday uh, for early uh, school readiness tax credits. So it's, it's in line with what the governor has been talking about, but this one's actually tied to quality ratings. So it's uh, from the model that um, is in place in Louisiana, and I think it has a lot of promise that we can also um, help with uh, the quality costs for daycare for all families. So those are the two areas that I would focus on. Thank you. I would say... Uh, for me, and I know you could talk about this forever, you could have a conference uh, in and of itself on this issue, but uh, every, every child, every family has access to a high-performing school, uh, and not just access um, by way of choice, but also transportation uh, to and from a high-performing school of their choice. That would be the one thing I would do. I would create a system in Minnesota for every single child to have access to high quality early learning experiences and for every family to have high quality affordable child care available to them. And there are lots of ways to do it. Many people uh, here support scholarships. I carry that bill, but there is a multitude of ways that we can achieve it. But the policy should be straightforward. Every child 
should have access and every family should be able to afford it. It's basic family economic security that helps all children and it, and it provides the basic enriching environment in which all kids can succeed and have a better chance at a long, healthy, and successful life. I, I certainly agree with my colleague from the House, Representative Winkler, and I think he hit it right in the head, the broad uh, policy that every child has access to that. If I had the magic wand, uh, though, and, and I work on the child task force, I'm carrying the bill there, and all the things, my, mine would go a little bit further. And my policy would be the power of one. And this is a call out to all the 900 folks here and those that are watching. We all have the ability to, to impact one child's life beyond our family. If all of us were to go help one kid read or go be a foster parent or do just one thing in your community, that collective power is far more than we can do in the policy in the legislature. The legislature can only do so much to change behavior, but we in the power of one can do so much more. If you just take that one kid, just that one that's reaching out, that one kid that you know in your neighborhood, and try to move them forward. That, that would be the one thing that I'd love to see. Thank you. We all agree about the importance of children and youth. We've all agreed this morning and have restated here, if we had a magic wand, what we would like to do. Of course, the reality is we don't have a magic wand. We have budget constraints, and we have competing demands and competing interests for our time, our resources. As stewards of the state's money, how would you go about deciding whether to put more money into early childhood or youth and education issues or fix bridges that may be falling down and roads with potholes? How do you go about that? Help us understand that. I will separate the question into how we should go about it versus how we actually do go about it. Uh, the legislature is a body of compromise and a body of sorting out interests and different points of view from different parts of the state. Unfortunately, children are not powerful. If children were powerful, would we have so many of them living in poverty? Would we have big disparities in education achievement? If children were powerful, would our, would our state look the way it does today? They would not. It would, our state would not look like it does today. We need to have children's champions in all of you at the legislature in order to get good things done. Because the way we make decisions is not based just on whether it's a good idea. I know that will shock you. It's not all just about deliberating for the common good. Much of it is finding out who has power and serving that power. That's just a statement of fact. That's not how it should be, but that's how it is. Each of you has the power to make a big difference in how the legislature makes decisions. You have the ability to influence legislation and budgets far more than you could ever imagine. The power of letters, emails, phone calls, and showing up at the Capitol, I think is dismissed by so many people and, and they think, well, they're not going to listen. It's just one voice. It's not really going to matter. But I will tell you, it matters a lot. The number of conversations that we have that are about how many uh, people we're hearing from on a certain subject or whether or not people seem to really be bothered, whether there's a, or a news story about some situation, we are very responsive to the, the people in our districts and their priorities. So even if you have a legislator who generally supports children's issues, you still need to raise your voice. You still need to be present so that they know that how much of a priority it is. Kids don't have the power to make those changes, but you have the power if you're willing to stand up and use it. You can't pause like that. You know, the rest of us will interject. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and, and this is a good representation, and Representative Winkler uh, is right on. And, and again, I'll go back to the power of one. And I was here when the governor gave his comments, and I, I just want to highlight, um, while we can be political, while the system will encourage that from time to time, we have to be very cautious of that. And while I agreed with all the governor's statements this morning, um, he did make a reference to the right-wing ideology. Um, good, bad, or indifferent, th that's not what sets the tone for us. Uh, and Peggy mentioned it in the, in the previous one. Uh, let's, let's put that partisanship away. Let's, I know it's, it's used once in a while, but we have lots of conversations at the Capitol. We catch each other on the way between uh, committees, and we sit in the back of the halls, and we talk about these things when we can. But the one thing I will iterate very strongly is the power of one in Representative Winkler. Call your legislator, no matter whether you 
absolutely agree or absolutely disagree with her or him, call us. Because those are the conversations that get to legislature. I will tell you, almost every single piece of legislation I've worked on came from a conversation that I had with somebody that brought a personal story to me that I expanded out into a broad scope to say, how do we make this uh, more broad and how do we fix this? And we know how things get done down there. Uh, we look for the coalitions, we look for the cooperation, and sometimes we make allies uh, with people that are unsuspecting of, sometimes we don't. But there's lots of ways to move things, and you have to give us the ability to make those conversations, to make those arguments, to sometimes get passion on the House floor, at the same time knowing when we get to our office, we're going to sit down and talk to you and listen to you and bring that to us. So um, I haven't found anybody down there yet that isn't willing to work for children and work for th these vulnerable and, and silenced voices. But bring your stories to us. We want to hear those. I would add, um, you know, we all in our initial comments seem to all agree that children and early childhood education is our a common denominator. We all want to strive to making sure we fund it accordingly. Uh, we have a state mandate to do so, to provide uh, public education for all Minnesotans, and it doesn't really tell you it ends at, you know, K through 12. It talks about public education more broadly. Um, the competing interests, I would say, with uh, uh, to the question uh, whether it's transportation or health and human services and what have you, uh, it really is a real conversation uh, in both areas. Uh, one has a cons constitutional mandate for gas tax. So on the wonky side, I serve on that committee. Uh, whether that's enough, um, a lot of people say that it, it isn't, so that's the debate we have. We haven't agreed on a common place in that debate, but on education, I would say we all agree that this is a very important issue. It not only addresses our, our gaps in, in achievement, but it also addresses our workforce development. So when we all acknowledge that that is a problem, that we have an issue, that we have the data in front of us, and we acknowledge that there is a way and a path to invest money early like you would for retirement because it has higher you know, dividends the, the earlier you start, it's the same notion, and I think we agree on, on that premise. The question is, what programs we do, we use or fund to address it. So whether it's a tax credit, whether it's a, a general fund dollars, whether it's um, uh, another tool reforming CCAP, we have different buckets in state government that all tackle early childhood education and it makes it really messy. And a lot of you who are in the weeds understand that. Um, and if you don't, um, you, you have a sense and why is money coming from CCAP, from HHS, why is money coming from uh, the tax credit bill from general fund dollars. So we have to, work within those um, complexities to to figure things out and we don't always agree on that and that's where the where it becomes a little bit more political but we agree on the concept so that's a good starting point and I think early childhood education um, has come a long way uh, to where we are today uh, you know we've talked about it for a lot a long time but we haven't seen this investment until two years ago it was the first wave 40 million dollars that came for the scholarships and now we're talking about potentially tax credits to help with child care services as well and then CCAP um, I know there's a lot of advocates here that are looking to reform that and, and we need to um, it's outdated and we need your advocacy at the Capitol to make those arguments you're the experts in the room and you bring a lot more credibility than us um, we're there to advocate on your behalf I know in their early childhood scholarships debate it was Senator um, Representative Winkler and I um, late hours at night in in a conference committee to make sure that the money stayed in the budget and that makes a difference but it makes a bigger difference and if we're not alone so I would agree with um, what everyone else is talking about to really be engaged in your voice and, and your body and your presence matters. Yeah, I would, uh, I'm going to piggyback a bit on what Representative Winkler said and, and maybe even go a step further. Um, the reason things happen at the Capitol nine and a half times out of ten is because it is deemed to, to suit the political interests of those that have power. And if you want to make a difference, um, be articulate, be, be kind, be generous, uh, lay out your argument the best you can, but you need to organize and you need to act. Um, po political force is what gets things done in St. Paul. Uh, it's a reality that uh, none of you like, but I assure you that if all of you have ex would have experienced the things that I experienced in my five years at the legislature, number one, you'd be disgusted. But number two, you'd understand exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, Representative Winkler is absolutely right. Uh, you must organize, you must act, and you must make policymakers uh, make decisions that suit their political interests, even if they don't want to, by way of your action. Um, 
how I would make the decision um, between those things. I think oftentimes we address public policy in, in silos. So we, we look at education, we just talk about education stuff. Or we look at transportation, we just talk about transportation stuff. But if I'm a, a young uh, black child growing up in North Minneapolis, I face a reality of uh, a history of, of blatantly racist infrastructure decisions when it comes to transportation routing highways through communities or underserving mass transit. Look at a criminal justice system that is stealing uh, an entire generation's future uh, from them and their hope for those who are lucky enough not to uh, have their run in with, with the law. And you have uh, public schools that um, are, are failing, and I'll just say it, are failing in some instances. So, so I think um, you've always got to look at how all of these policies interact. Um, you can't simply address each one as if uh, they're, they're unto themselves. So, We're going to shift just a bit. In an op-ed on December 31st in the New York Times, there was a piece entitled Social Programs That Work, and it's been making the rounds. Um, the point that I'm referring to is their statement that the Obama administration has really dialed up the attempt at rigorous evaluations of social programs. And they report that the evaluations are indicating that about, quote, 75% of programs or practices intended to help people do better at school or work have little or no effect. They go on to state that studies of early childhood education program Head Start show that even when there are benefits they're often modest and not enduring. Your reaction to that, your lessons learned, if you will, for your work as a policymaker in Minnesota on these issues. Well, I, I can chime in. Um, you know, and coming from a background of corporate where every decision is made with, you know, a, a, a database and, and, and making sure that the dollar makes sense and if it doesn't work we move and shift to something else. I, I think that is lacking to a certain extent in government, to a big extent actually, because when we make decisions we have a dashboard but we only look short term. We look a couple years, two or three, you know, biennium, maybe two, and we make those decisions and we don't look long term and we don't reassess whether the programs we're funding actually work. We don't have a uh, metrics of the return on our invest investment, and that should change. And I'm not suggesting that we need a whole new department for that, but we need to really find a way to creatively insert um, that measure into our decision making. It's not politically um, something that anyone wants to do because uh, there is a, a, a reason why we keep it short-sighted and, and in, in terms of the politics, but it doesn't make policy sense. Um, and that's my background as well, so i rather um, look for programs and, and work on programs and invest in proposals that actually have that backing and research and, and those are, and, you know, you have to go that extra mile to do that work and that research, um, but when it comes to decision making committee, we don't see that. So that's again another way where we need um, your involvement to really advocate for where you want the taxpayer money that you're putting into the system to go. Um, so I think that needs to be addressed, um, but there is no uh, political uh, will to do so because again it's not the way we've done business in the past so now you know we need to demand that and I think uh, there is some people that I would agree with in, in our in our um, legislature who think the same way and I would imagine a lot of people on this panel do uh, is how do we do that how do we make that change um, it's changing culture uh, of, of how the political system works but we need to do it because obviously uh, with those numbers um, we're probably wasting that much money if it's not really reaping the benefits that we're paying for so um, I think we just need to revisit how how we make those decisions Please. yeah I think um, we've done a lot actually in the last four or five years in the education space um, we we passed the state's first teacher evaluation law which was implemented at the beginning of this year uh, which is one of the more significant policy changes in the last few decades uh, we've uh, implemented all day kindergarten uh, we've rolled out early childhood scholarships um, and we've done a lot of it uh, and there's very little um, data on, on on any of it at this point so we've made hundreds of millions of dollars in investments and really billions over time if you look into the tails um, without, without having an understanding of how each one of these things is interacting and what impact it's having. I know there's a bunch of 
folks probably in this room who'd like to see, you know, $550 million for universal uh, pre-K. Um, <laughs> today, you know, you'd want it today. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the fact is that um, I, th I think in order to avoid a knee-jerk opposition or reaction from folks who may still need to be convinced about that, I think, I think you'd be, uh, I, I, think, I, I think some, some degree of, of, of a measured approach would be wise. And, and from a policy-making standpoint, um, I, th I know there are people that are all in on, on early K, maybe even home visitation for infants. Um, but uh, I think if we're going to make wise policy decisions, we should at least um, take a look at s and see how some of these major changes are working out before we go ahead and, and, and do that. So that was a, that was a good editorial in, in the Times. I remember reading that and thinking about that. And we all want metrics. And, and we all want the perfect dashboard that says this program is working, this one isn't. Um, and coming from a corporate world and into education, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. It, it's tougher with policy because, and I'll give you a good example. Uh, every child that we think about and we, we try to worry about has so many different places where they, they're touched by adults. Uh, they may move through social services. They're, they're going to get off a bus. They're going to walk into the hallways of a, a classroom. Uh, they're going to be an after-school program. And, and every touch point that we have with that, that student or that child has their own metrics of success. Uh, what we don't have a good way to do is collectively look and say, okay, what is our real metric? Uh, where do we really go? And because everybody uses metrics to, de to defend their budgets, it creates the competing interests that we have. And absolutely, uh, early childhood is going to claim all the wonderful things they have, and they're going to define and define and look for budget, while at the same time you're going to hear the high school program talking about STEM, and you're going to talk about why they need Bunsen burners. And all of this stuff starts to compete, so it becomes very, very difficult. My perfect uh, way, and if we could ever get this would be wonderful, if we could find a single touch point. Uh, is it that time when the, the student enters, gets off the bus, enters the school? Or where is that where we can start to look at all the different ways? Because I'm working on the child task force, and I've got a bill that we're going we're gonna to do some things around child protection. I know many of those students, many of those children are also going to need early childhood. Many of them are going to need CCAP. And it's just how do we get that all together? And it's how do we make that $1 get as much as we can to move that, that student forward or that child forward? And it's very, very difficult. So while I appreciate looking at all the metrics, um, it can be the thing that sets us back or the thing that sets us forward, depending on how we use the data. In response to that article, which I haven't read, but as you've described it, uh, I would say that imperfection cannot be an excuse for doing nothing. And it is better by far if we waste 50 cents on a dollar investing in young kids than if we invest nothing in them. So we need to, sorry. We need to be focused on metrics. But let's not go overboard and believe that just because uh, the corporate world has financial models that they're always successful. In fact, most mergers and acquisitions fail as a financial matter. Businesses fail. They take risks because the risk is worth the benefit. And the risk of investing in kids is worth the benefit. And we do have to follow that uh, success, and we have to try to focus on what we can do best. But we cannot use that as an excuse for sitting on our hands and saying nothing good can be done. That's just a cop-out. There's a lot of passion here. <laughs> and I appreciate it, and I wish we had lots of more time. It's a, a bit of a 10-minute uh, warning light going on here. Um, and I'm trying to sort through of the 10 questions I want to ask where to start. Um, so so let, me ask, let, let me ask a question that I'm going to personalize for a bit. The last time I was in St. Paul with a group of about 900 uh, was a group of business colleagues. Um, one, of the, one of the issues talked about, of course, was taxes. Um, Minnesota businesses, competitive environments, needing resources to grow. Are we talking about a legislative environment where to accomplish what we all want to do for youth and families, you will have to raise our taxes? And how do you make the case if that's a yes? I will be the only one on this panel who will give you an unequivocal yes. Um, if you look actually at the cost of, of government in Minnesota, the share of our economy that is devoted to government programs at all levels 
it is shrinking. We don't include inflation in our budget forecast, which means that every single time we look at our budget, we're assuming that nothing costs anything more, which means that we are constantly trying to catch up as inflation grows. Uh, Minnesota is not an overtaxed state. Minnesota has a st is a state with tremendous resources, very high incomes, and has right now a budget surplus. When times are good, it is the right time to reinvest in the future. And I think that there is no way to do what people want to do for children, for the next generation of education, for workforce, without putting money behind it. And abs I mean, it's possible, I suppose, to eliminate protections for seniors and for the disabled and for uh, any support for higher education and to repurpose all of those dollars. But the fact of the matter is that government in Minnesota is not growing out of control. It has been on a steady but slow decline for well over a decade in terms of total spending. So I think that it does require more resources through taxes. Thank you. I suspect this is going to play out well on the House floor a couple times. <laughs> uh, so as the bipolar guy up here who's carrying the uh, Child Protection Task Force bill and the early childhood, I'm also carrying the largest tax uh, incentive to decrease taxes for businesses. So, um, and, and let me tell you why. Because uh, there, there's a, a personal reason for this and some things I understand. When I left education, I started a company. Uh, that was, was very, very successful. It was an online learning company in Little Falls. Uh, it was a 65 employee company international when I left. And as I sat, and we were a small company that moved from an LLC, a couple guys that got together with ideas. We moved through and we became this international company and we brought people together and we hired people. And I remember at Christmas times as I was giving out bonuses and we were talking to folks and I was making those families their, a difference at Christmas. Uh, when I sat down to them and they would say to me, you know, thank goodness I have this job. I don't have to travel 30 miles. This is what I've been looking for. I can have time with my family. We had flexible hours. They could go, uh, you know, if someone called me and said, hey, I have a birthday lunch at school, the answer was always go. Because we knew that they were going to be there later that day doing things. So business has the power to change lives. And I talk about the power of one. And while it may not be a perfect solution, I want to drive down the incentive and I want to say to business leaders, and there's probably many of them in this room, Go out there and invest in your communities because you can make a huge difference. You can hire that person. You can get those wages up, and you can do things that government can't do. And so th that's the uh, bipolar side that I, I work with. Um, I don't think government can fix all those. I know uh, some people will try to push those, and that's great. I would love to drive those down. I mean, in a perfect world, I would drive that down to the, the female or the male business owner who's out there making the difference and have them come to the Capitol and say, listen, if you let me grow faster and you let me hire more people, I can make a huge difference. And so that's where I come on that. And so I'm looking for incentives on both sides of those, and I, I look forward to those debates. I, well, go ahead. <laughs> I would say no and yes, um, so I'm not, I, I'm on both camps, if you will. Um, I voted against the tax bill. I thought it was too large, but I have voted for the gas tax before, and I will do it again. Um, in that context, I think there's no way I can see that we have the funding in our general budget to address the needs and the future needs of our state, and okay. they're dismal to just keep, and I know we don't have that much time because I can go on and on about transportation. I'm pretty passionate about that issue because of the lack of investment there as well for businesses and for everyday Minnesotans who rely on, on transit transportation of some sort for goods and services and to get to work. Um, on that context, I am open to it. Um, and not full-blown uh, sky is the limit. There should be limits on what we can pay for. Um, and I understand people's budgets, and, and we need to, to, to definitely have that into consideration. But on the other hand, um, taxes were raised in the, in the last biennium, and I don't see there is a need to continue in that trend um, when we have money that we just have to prioritize where we want to spend the, that money. Um, but on the transportation side, I, I see there's room for improvement there um, when it comes to uh, extra funding. Uh, no. <laughs> I forgot the question. Uh, the, uh, no, I, I'll, I'll give an answer that is uh, is general in nature, as is Representative Winkler. Um, Representative Winkler, I think, very very uh, nicely articulated in his previous response that uh, it's the inherent nature of any organization or organizations to have some degree of failure. So, if you look at state government as a collection of thousands of different organizations and initiatives. Um, inevitably, 
there will be a certain percentage of those initiatives that fail, not because of malice or because uh, of anybody's ill intent, but, but ju just because that's the way that it is, especially with an entity that's the size of, of the state of Minnesota. And so inherent in that then be begs the question, well, well, what are those things that we're not doing well, and, and how do we repurpose the resources that we have? And, and we could argue about the percentage of, of those things that aren't working well, but to suggest that we continue to perpetuate programs, and, and frankly, I can't name a single significant program that has ever been repealed once it started. For example, if, if and, and I'll say this, and of course you'd, you'd, all, you'd all assert that this isn't true, but let's just say we move forward with a, a universal pre-K that went all the way to, to birth. And let's say empirically that that did, didn't demonstrate over time that it was working. My, my experience shows that that's never going to go away. Uh, that, that, gover it, that government is not capable of eliminating things that don't work. And so, so uh, I would posit that there is uh, plenty of resources that can be repurposed and rededicated to, ac to accomplish other things. I think the frustration, however, um, that I do understand with folks, especially poor and middle class folks, is that they get the feeling like uh, the well-connected and the special interests always get what they need. And that's absolutely true. Uh, whether you look at big business, uh, whether you look at sports franchises, uh, whether you look at big labor, um, they always seem to find a way to get what they want. And the tax cuts even that you hear about oftentimes are so narrow and so dedicated to certain special interests that you never actually see it. And so you're tired of hearing about it, frankly. It's not real to you. And I think we need to get back to a place where we, we, we start serving and we start being honest with people about taxes. We, we start being honest with people about spending. We, and, and we start acting in a way that is, is frankly, less, less curried to, to those who are connected. And I think, uh, I think we'd all be able to live with, with that a, a, lot, a lot easier. So. Thank you. In, in fairness, responses to the next question could each be uh, an hour plus. So it's an unfair question because I'm asking for your response in 30 seconds or less. Apologies in advance. When I was more involved, uh, on the, when I was involved in the nonprofit sector and advocating for invest early and early childhood work at the Capitol, one of the arguments I heard was it's my own business. It's my own family's business. It's state overreach to go as far as the state was considering, proposing, um, and we know the benefits of, of being involved in children's life before they're born and the intensive work that, that has great benefits, families, individuals, communities, when we're involved early on. Um, your, your opinion, is this, is this an area where the state ought to be going policy-wise how far should the state go? Good luck in the next 30 seconds, each of you. Melissa? Sure. Well, in 30 seconds, um, what comes to mind is affordability and, ex and access to the right tools that we need for every one of us and our kids and grandkids to have the best uh, life that they can have and they can be productive citizens. So I think if you start with that notion that we don't always have those the backgrounds to, to afford and have access to certain um, programs or certain um, opportunities, I wouldn't call them program, but opportunities for life, uh, I think there is a role for the state to play because not all of us can afford it, not all of us have access to it depending where we are in our state. Um, you know, this is education but we come across it in, in that same issue with pretty much every issue that comes at, to, to the legislature. Is it an overreach to tell businesses what to do? Is it an overreach to tell schools to, to what to do? So. We grapple with that in every level, and I think um, for, for this context, for early childhood, um, certainly we know there is a need, we know there is an unmet need, and we want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to succeed, and that is why I think there is a, a compelling interest for state to be involved. Yeah, um, so I think it's important to point out, and everybody is aware of this, but oftentimes we sanitize um, we sanitize it by calling it taxes or revenue, that we're 
confiscating people's property. Uh, we're taking people's property that live in Minnesota and we're doing that which we see fit with it. And that, with that, and that's, an, and that's necessary. That's a necessary part of government. That's a necessary part of society, and I appreciate that. But it does come with a very significant responsibility, and it's one that, that I think requires good judgment and measured judgment. And we're talking about massive investments here. Let's, mm -hmm. let's be honest. And, and I think that in, in this particular case, rolling out uh, this program at this size, I don't think has been vetted to the degree that it has. There's still significant disagreements even on how these programs are funded. If you're familiar with the Pathway 1 versus Pathway 2 conversation, there's significant and, and, and merited arguments coming from both Democrats and Republicans. Oftentimes there's agreement. So, so let's, let's be measured. Let's actually try to make um, some informed decisions, not based even on generalized research, but let's, let's look at what's actually happening in Minnesota and then make our decisions uh, that way. And, and that's, that's how I would prefer to go about doing it. Uh, I think the question is about the role of family versus the role of government. And my way of looking at this is that if you believe in opportunity and you believe in freedom, then it is unacceptable that an entire life uh, can be written just in the first chapter. And that is why as our society, uh, in a society that believes that the individual should be able to reach their full potential, we have to be in this space because it is not right that people's lives should be determined in the first five years and that the lottery of birth and the lottery of early learning and early life experiences decides everything else and that individual never has the ability to choose, to do anything about it, or to make a difference. So I am not one who's willing to say that three-year-olds should be pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps and be more personally responsible. Oh, that's cute. It is so hard to follow, Representative. <laughs> I'm glad I went first. But I'm last, so I get the microphone. Uh, so as I look at this, and I, I especially I'll, I'll take just a quick slice on the Child Protection Task Force. Um, that's one of the areas that I hear the most about. When do we come in? When does the Child Protection Services come in? When do they not come in? And I will tell you, from everybody that I've talked to, the hardest decision they make is pulling that child out of that family. Because no matter what happens, that child loves his or her uh, mother or father. And you're breaking that tie. I mean, it's, it's the most basic tie that child has. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do. And a lot of times when those children are disrupted, they don't understand it either. They don't, even, even though the world they may live in is very, very hard and very harsh by objective standards, they don't understand why their world is being shaken up more. And so my point in all of this is there are times we have to play in this space, absolutely. Uh, government has a role because these youngest citizens, these, these folks that are coming up, this, we are their voice. And we have to do that as a, as a government. Now, Remember, government agencies are reactive. They are reacting to everything that's happening. Uh, we try to be proactive, but we're reacting to a situation. A law enforcement's reacting to the information that's in front of them. Child Protection Services is reacting to what's in front of them. And I go back to the power of one. And what I learned uh, in teaching curriculum was one person in one child's life, giving them security, giving them just the basics they need, and getting that child to read by age five will make a huge difference in the trajectory of that child. Absolutely, the lottery of life can be very, very unfair, and it is, but we shouldn't stack the cards against them. And so, again, there's many, many people out there that could just make a difference. Uh, get, you know, read to your children. If, if you could all take a Dr. Seuss book home and file a child and read to that child every single night, the impact you would have would be huge. And then we can use the government services for those cases where we can't get to them, because we have to be reactive, we have to, and I can't sleep at night not knowing that I didn't push a piece of legislation that will save a child that, that could have been saved. Representatives Kresha and Winkler and Senators Franzen and Peterson, thank you for your service to youth and children and families in the state and your passion and time you gave us today. And Frank, it's lunchtime. <laughs>
we do have one set of closing remarks. Uh, and I also want to say thank you for your service. Please know that you have earned our respect and gratitude because democracy does not work unless leaders like you rise up, seek elected office, and really help our community grapple with these issues. Uh, our respect and gratitude. Thank you.